wanted to start recording before right. this, so we're recording. This is Science Slam. This is our very first guinea pig, Richard, who's going to talk about the cerebellum and its moody friends. So take it away! Yeah, so I wanted to tell you guys a story tonight, maybe something off Craigslist, misconnections in the brain. Our hero tonight will be the cerebellum, which is Latin for little brain. And the cerebellum is located in the back of your head, under all this hair and my skull. And actually, little brain is kind of a misnomer because, um, you know, your brain has 80 billion neurons, but the cerebellum contains half to three quarters of it. The cerebellum is a very interesting fellow who has long been relegated to just controlling motor activity, like, you know, helping you move through space in a coordinated manner, or like orienting your eyes or teaching you how to ride a bike. But is that all it really does? Recently, clinical um, studies have shown that like patients who have lesions or damage to their cere cerebellum, either from birth or from trauma later in life, they have deficits. Motor, of course, as you would expect since it's the motor part of the brain, but also to emotion and cognition. And indeed, patients who have a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders, anything from autism to depression to anxiety to schizophrenia, they all they commonly have these deformities in the cerebellum. But how is something that has long been thought to be only for motor or movement involved with these diseases that aren't about that? Well, maybe the field missed something. Because, you know, there's a lot we don't know about the brain. So to figure this out, um, my colleagues and I made some injections into the cerebellum with tracers that allow you to visualize these neurons and to see where they connect to in the brain. So they would fluoresce a really pretty color. Um, imagine, if you will, like a stream, a river of fluorescent um, axons, these cables that come from the cerebellum that flow out into the brain. And these axons, these, this river, form smaller tributaries that branch out and touch neurons downstream to it. And what we found is that this, the cerebellum talks to many more parts of the brain than you'd expect, and not only to parts of the brain that are involved with your movement. No, in fact, it's parts of the brain that are involved with mood and um, your emotion. Um, neurons that have um, chemicals that we try to target for depression or for uh, bipolar disorder, for example, like serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. These guys, you know, you see in a microscope, get these um, uh, uh, contacts from the cerebellum, like a little kiss onto these serotonin neurons, for example. And this is important because this is something that we completely were not aware of. But this is just the first step, knowing that the cerebellum has this connection with these moody parts of the brain that are involved with emotion. Because we can do a lot better. We can figure out exactly who these neurons are and who they talk to. Um, and one way we could do this is Neurons have personality, just like people do. Um, you know, a person's personality might tell you a lot about who they might be friends with, who they hang out with. And as such, we think that knowing a neuron's personality, you also can figure out who they talk to. What do I mean by a neuron having a personality? Well, superficially, neurons are not all the same, right? Like, they have different shapes. In a biology textbook, you see a circle, and that's a neuron. And some neurons are actually like that. Others are big, hulking masses. Others have like these pyramidal shapes. And others have these beautiful branches that make it look like a tree. So they're different in at least looks. But they also talk differently. Neurons communicate. They fire um, to transmit information to one another. And some neurons are very talkative. Like neurons in the cerebellum, for example, they fire anywhere from 50 to 500 times a second. So something like a lot faster in like every moment of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Serotonin neurons, by contrast, fire just once to eight times a second. So they're like, hi, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so very different. And they're also located in different parts of the brain. So like, you know, they have different characteristics, but they cluster in different regions. They hang out in different parts of the brain. And so we took this in mind and profiled the genetic expression of individual neurons from the cerebellum and found that we could group them into different categories. And these different types of neurons correlate with how they are sized, what their shapes are, how they talk, you know, how quickly they activate, as well as where they're located in the cerebellum. 
And my preliminary results find that these types of neurons have very specific targets. They have very particular friends that they go to. So it's like I say, like in a high school, I can look at the jocks. They're very big and muscly. They hang out mostly at the gym, and they talk mostly with the cheerleaders. And that's what I'm trying to figure out with the neurons. Um, so, so I, okay, okay, I'll finish. <laughs> um, so, the two things I want you guys to take away from this is that the cerebellum has connections with these moody fellows, and knowing their particular personalities helps us figure out who exactly their friends are. And this is important because the cerebellum has long been just thought of as a motor center, but in fact it might be implicated in all these emotional outputs as well as these mood disorders. And figuring this out will help us um, come up with better um, uh, treatments for people who suffer from different neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so I hope I convinced you tonight that the little brain is not so little, and in fact is perhaps very important to understanding mood and for our developing better treatments for disorders in mood. Thank you. Yeah, for those who are joining us, um, make sure to, if, if you're just joining us, um, take, take a small thing of um, post-its. These are for notes for the presenters. Yeah, so the little post-it notes uh, and pens are actually, since we're holding our questions, it's one way to uh, um, remember your question at the end, but also uh, it, for voting, because we're voting for the most effective communicator, um, and also the most creative communicator. Um, yeah. So since you're videotaping, by some strange set of circumstances, I found a GoPro in my backpack. Would you like me to videotape the talk screen? Absolutely. <laughs> cool. You want to do that again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Should have to wear the GoPro so they could see the... Like, <laughs> My, my helmet strap is at home. Uh, <laughs> that would be perfect to catch people that are like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, live tweet. <laughs> so next up we have is Elizabeth, and she's going to talk to us about regulatory T cells um, and lupus. Yep. Do you want to take it away? I'm yes. not going to hit start until you your your up, okay. so don't worry. Oh, I got it. Oh yeah, protect everyone else. Sure that it's connected to. So it's not right now. Not allow. We'll allow it. Do you want me to make two sides? Uh that's okay. It kind of I think I can do it. But thank you. Okay, I'm ready. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. My name is Elizabeth and I'm a third year graduate student at the University of Maryland here in Baltimore City. So my lab studies autoimmune disease and first I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit of background about autoimmunity and then I'll tell you more specifically about what I'm studying. So simply put, autoimmunity is an immune response that's generated against your own body. And when this happens and the immune system doesn't regulate it, an autoimmune disease develops. There are many types of autoimmune diseases, but I've listed some of the most common up here, like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, celiac disease, and type 1 diabetes. Naturally, our immune system evolved to kill off microbes that invade our body, not to attack our own body. But there are multiple factors that can cause an immune response to be generated against ourself. One of those is genetic factors. Some people actually have genetic mutations that make them more likely to develop an autoimmune disease. Also environmental factors, some infections like Lyme disease can uh, cause you to develop an autoimmune disease. And then finally, uh, improper regulation of the immune system. So being an immunologist, I'm interested in studying why, in the case of autoimmune disease, the immune system is not regulating the attack that's happening against your body. So first, why is it important to regulate an immune response? Well, inherently we have an immune response to protect us from infection. When there is an infection, the immune response uh, causes inflammation to kill off whatever microbe has invaded us. So this inflammation presents in the form of redness, fever, swelling, and the inflammation makes it possible to kill that microbe, but it also damages our body. 
So after the infection has been cleared, there has to be repair. And that repair is done by suppressing the inflammation. Again, this repair is necessary, but you don't want to be in a constant state of repair because your immune system in this state is less likely to, less likely to be able to fight off future infections. So once there's been enough repair, then we, uh, our body gets back to a state of homeostasis, which is basically like when everything's in balance until we get infected with something again. For people who have autoimmune diseases though, it's like their body is always in a state of infection, but there's no infection, it's just fighting off your own body. So, uh, how is an immune response le it regulated? What's responsible for this suppression or regulation? Well first, when your immune cells are developing, they're actually educated on what is self and what is not self. And the ones that react to self are deleted. We call this tolerance, but I like to think of it as like education or schooling for your immune cells. And in theory, this means that there should never be an immune cell that can react against your own body. But like with any system, it's not perfect. And some cells that are self-reactive escape this schooling. So there are actually other immune cells that are known to stop these cells that are self-reactive, the ones that escape the schooling. And uh, there are a couple different type of regulatory cells, but my lab specifically studies T regulatory cells, and we call them Tregs for short. So you're probably wondering, if we have tolerance and we have regulatory cells, why do people ever get autoimmune diseases? And that's a really good question. That's pretty much what immunologists are asking too. So one of the first immunologists that asked this question was thinking that maybe people who got autoimmune diseases got them because they didn't have Tregs. So my boss, Dr. Golding, asked this specific question in patients that have lupus. And his research showed that people with active lupus have the same number of Tregs as a healthy person. Um, and even with inactive lupus, which is what I'm showing up here right now. So like with a lot of scientific discoveries, this was really surprising. It was counterintuitive to what we thought was gonna be the case. So after this discovery, uh, he thought to himself, okay, if the Tregs are there, maybe they're not uh, suppressing the autoimmunity because they can't. Maybe they're not doing their job because they're dysfunctional. And so this finally gets us to what I'm researching. My thesis project is based around this idea that maybe Tregs and autoimmunity are dysfunctional. Specifically, I'm researching whether or not the Tregs can suppress the production of antibodies. Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you all about antibodies, but suffice it to say that uh, antibodies can cause inflammation. So our theory is that in healthy people, uh, some cells escape the education that I was telling you about, about what is self and what isn't, and they start making antibodies against parts of the body, which is what I'm showing up here. And uh, when this happens, Tregs come in and they say, stop, we don't need that kind of inflammation in the body. And so then there's no autoimmune disease. However, in people who eventually develop autoimmune, uh, autoimmunity, for some reason their Tregs come in but they don't say anything. They're unable to tell these antibody producing cells to stop. So the amount of antibody that's present that's against your body increases and eventually an autoimmune disease develops. So if we show with our research that this is actually what's happening, then we want to better understand why the Tregs are dysfunctional and maybe eventually we can develop some treatments to make these Tregs functional again and to suppress the autoimmune response that exists in people who have autoimmune diseases. Okay, yeah, so I'm Ben. I'm also a third year, uh, as Sarah said. And my research is focusing on the breast cancer microenvironment. Everybody, the common conception of cancer is that you have this you know, massive cells which become malignant and they grow and proliferate, and these cells are what the cancer is. And that's true, but they're not alone. And what this means is we have a lot of review papers with great puns, like it takes a village to make cancer, or my favorite, <laughs> with a little help from my friends. But first, like, why is breast cancer specifically important? It's, this is very small on here, but it's very, it's the most common cancer in women with 20% of their cancers, and the second uh, leading cause of cancer mortality in women with 15%. But 
in obese women, this is even uh, worse. There's a 30% increased risk of uh, developing breast cancer in postmenopausal women who are obese. They have a 50% increased rate of cancer recurrence and a 33% 30, uh, increased risk of mortality. And so a lot of researchers in cancer right now are asking why is this happening? What is different in the obese breast compared to the normal breast specifically that is causing this uh, increased tumor genesis and increased malignancy? And so to answer this question first, we need to talk a bit about the architecture of the breast. So what we have here, the three main parts are the lobules, which are the milk producing or, uh, parts of the organ, which connect to the ducts, which connect to the nipple to secrete the milk. And surrounding this area of the breast is adipocytes and throughout the breast in general are adipocytes and then connective tissue in between the lobules and the ducts, which is primarily composed of adipocytes or fat cells and then other connective tissues. Um, and what we see is this is a zoom in of a duct and we have these epithelial cells surrounded by myoepithelial cells and these are what become cancerous and tumorigenic and will proliferate uncontrolled and grow rapidly eventually invading out of here and surrounding these again are the adipocytes or fat cells and then the fibroblasts which secrete the uh, components of the basal membrane the connective tissue such as collagen as well as immune cells and stem cells and other things uh, just kind of in this whole milieu in this whole cell population and then as breast uh, as breast cells kind of invade out they become even more in closer contact with the adipocytes so you see an invasive front of a breast tumor here and what this means is in the normal breast we have communication with uh, small molecules being secreted by adipocytes and fibroblasts between uh, and affecting the breast cells and then as they invade out we have even <coughs> closer uh, kind of contact and small molecule communication but also the basal membranes that are being produced and this, the connective tissues that are being produced by the fibroblasts differ in obese cancer, uh, obese cells. But in, as they invade out, we have this communication causes a re-education of the microenvironmental cells as well as a re-education and uh, pro-tumorigenic effect on the cancer cells. So the cancer cells secrete these factors which cause their environment to become more pro-tumorigenic and they become cancer-associated fibroblasts and cancer-associated adipocytes, which then secrete factors which are more promoting, uh, promote the breast cancer more. And so we have this kind of feedback loop where it's feeding the microenvironment and causing the microenvironment to feed itself even more. And so maybe by targeting this loop, we can, uh, it, it can be a new target in breast cancer therapy. So the hypothesis that we're working on right now has to do with this uh, microRNA called MIR140. And this is a small molecule which uh, kind of targets and has effects throughout stemness and also some differentiation. And what we saw is that it is downregulated in high fat diet adipocytes and mice. So in this uh, trial, what we're doing is we have mice that we're feeding on a regular diet, and then we have mice that we're giving a high fat diet, which consists of 60% kilocalories from fat. And so these mice become obese, generally about 40 to 50 grams compared to 20 to 25. And we're isolating cells from these mice and from their mammary glands and the stromal cells and adipocytes around those mammary glands and then comparing them to the regular diet as well as the regular diet fed knockout mice that we have. So that don't have the MIR140. And what we've, what we've seen and what our working hypothesis is basically as the adipocytes grow and as obesity occurs, MIR140 is downregulated. And the differential factors that these adipocytes and fat cells or fat cells secrete are re-educating uh, the stem cells in that environment and causing them to, instead of differentiating into fire, fibroblasts, differentiate into a cancer-associated myo, like myofibroblast. And this is re-educating the microenvironment and making it stiffer and denser and more pro-tumorigenic. And so what we, and increasing malignancy. And so what we hope to do is by uh, being able to target this microRNA kind of effect and cancel out that effect of the <coughs> increased uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts caused by obesity. Yeah. Think for a moment about all the muscles that are in your body, your arms that you're using to hold the beer in your hand right now, 
your legs that you use to walk yourself here, your diaphragm that controls your breathing, your heart that pumps blood throughout your entire body, all of that is muscle. Now for thousands of young boys all across the world, they're born with a certain genetic defect. They're born with a protein missing that will ultimately deny them the use of their muscle. By the age of nine or 10, they can't even lift up a spoon to eat a bowl of cereal. By the age of 13, they're not able to walk. They spend the rest of their life in the wheelchair. And they usually die by the age of 30. Now, for those of you in the audience who remember the Jerry Lewis telethon, you know what disease I'm talking about. It's a disease known as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These boys are missing just a single protein in muscle called dystrophin. That, when it's missing, causes all sorts of things to go wrong, an ultimate failure of all the muscle in the body. Now, there, as of right now, as of at least this morning, there are no currently available therapies for Duchenne in the clinic. There are a number of different uh, methodologies, different sorts of treatments that are in the works right now, but one of them involves cell therapy. The basic idea of that is taking healthy human stem cells derived from various sources, injecting them into muscle. And the idea is that those stem cells will bring that protein back to the muscle. Now, that sounds great. But there have been trials ever since the 1980s looking at different types of cells and different ways of injecting and different numbers, and none of them have worked. Why is that? If you put a healthy cell into a hostile environment, a diseased environment, where muscle is constantly growing and breaking down, growing and breaking down, there's no room for healthy muscle to grow. What I'm working on as a graduate student at Johns Hopkins is an injectable environment, an environment where cells can thrive where they can grow, where they can multiply, and where they can ultimately form healthy muscle. This environment, which I'm gonna hereafter refer to as a hydrogel, allows the cells to spread from tendon to tendon inside of a muscle. The muscles don't just stick in one place, they spread throughout the whole thing. I've shown at a one week time point uh, in mice that when you inject cells with this hydrogel, they're four times more likely to survive. Cells here are these little pink dots, and you can see more of them in the presence of the gel than you can without it. Now, most importantly is, do these cells restore this missing dystrophin protein? And we show in a six-week time point that they do. This image here um, shows a number of different proteins that are present in mouse muscle. So this is a mouse that's got human muscle in red and this human protein restored in green. Now, you might say, okay, that's maybe one fiber, um, within a whole set of muscle fibers. But that's okay. If we restore even a fraction of that dystrophin protein, it's the difference between being able to, being stuck in a wheelchair and being able to walk again. Living until the age of 30 and living a full and healthy life. Now, we've got a long way to go. There are a number of different factors that play into the uh, effectiveness of this gel. Um, the immune system plays a role, engineering parameters play a role, but. I mean, ultimately, there's nothing for these kids right now, so I'm hoping that just with a little bit of my work, I can do something. Thank you for your time. The, the, you mentioned insulin. Yeah. So have you produced insulin in that system, or uh, is, is, that, is that the goal that you're, you're trying to achieve? Insulin is one of our long-term goals. Um, it's certainly one of our, our targets that we're going for. Um, it's not one that we worked on specifically, although, well, I haven't worked on it specifically. My collaborators within the larger team have. I haven't specifically. So it's being worked on within the group. You, using your, his, your suitcase bioreactor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, but we have worked on other therapeutic drugs. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of streptokinase. That's on the World Health Organization's list of most essential medicines. It's used for, uh, heart attacks, I believe. Um, so we worked on streptokinase, and actually I, I did an expression in purification of streptokinase just yesterday. Uh, it did not go so well, but it's fine. We can try again. And uh, we worked on erythropoietin, uh, which is used for anemia, and we've worked on GCSF, which is, I think the, the street name, not the, the pharmaceutical name, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's Phil Graston. So we, we worked on a number of drugs. And we're also, hopefully long term, we're, we're looking at monoclonal antibodies as well. Like Humira, for example. So we've got, we've got our, our eyes on a few different targets. Uh, I showed GFP just because visually it's, it's stimulated. It, you yeah. can see that. With most drugs, you can't actually see it because they don't floor us. So, so the economics of assembling that, that circuit bioreactor mm -hmm. 
uh, how, how expensive, I mean, a, a, a third world country. Right. Um, with comments on, on, that, on that angle. Uh, no, that's an excellent point. Um, we're aiming to try and make it for less than, I mean, I've heard this number banded around a little bit. I don't know how accurate it is at this point because it was talked about a few years ago. But our aim initially was like, oh, let's make this for less than $10,000. Um, the idea is that this isn't going to replace the pharmaceutical industry necessarily. It's going to supplement it. So we could give this to a relief aid worker. Uh, we could give this to a battlefield medic. Uh, we could give it to a, uh, a field hospital in the middle of Afghanistan, and they could use it. Uh, this wouldn't be purchased on a, an individual person-to-person -person basis necessarily, at least not at this stage. And if it could be, then that's a whole other level of government regulation that we were not getting into. <laughs> so, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask, like, how efficient is that to produce something that's usable, right? Like, because it's not just the cost of the suitcase, but also like when you put it, uh, like, what you get out for the amount of money that you spend. Right, no, that's a good point. Um, the thing is that when you're making a therapeutic drug, uh, first of all, it, it takes months and months to do it mm -hmm. in a traditional pharmaceutical setting. And it also takes a long time from the point of manufacture until it gets to the patient. Because uh, there's a massive distribution network. Right. And that's a big problem when you're living in a war zone, in a natural disaster, in a remote region. The idea is that with this device, you can make it within 24 hours on site. Um, and again, it's not meant to replace the pharmaceutical industry so much as it is meant to supplement it. So it's meant to be a stopgap while people are reestablishing trade lines or supply lines, uh, that type of thing. Um, but from a, from a standpoint of cost effectiveness, uh, I mean, it's still in early stages of research, so I, I can't really comment on that too heavily. What we're doing in order to try to keep the cost down is that we're using a lot of ready-made uh, readily available materials. The column that you saw in that video, mm -hmm. that was a column from Thermo Scientific that they sell commercially. And you can get a pack of five for like 150 bucks. Which is, from a scientific standpoint, it's relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. um, what cell lysates are you going to have this, this ready for? Is it, is it going to be, you know, is, is the end goal to be it can use 10 different cell lysates, mm -hmm. and what, what do you have it working with now? Uh, we initially started our work with HeLa, which is Henrietta Lacks uh, cancer cells. I don't know if everyone's familiar with them, because I don't really know the level of uh, scientific knowledge in the audience. Uh, we initially used those for testing, and we, based the, and we used those because our, one of our partners is Thermo Scientific. And, um, and um, uh, so they had that as a product readily built for purchase, so that's why we used it. Uh, as a result of the research that we've done, both in our labs and in Thermo Scientific, uh, consequently, they're now, we're now using a Cho cell lysate, which is Chinese hamster ovary. Um, and that's actually a product that they have uh, readily available for purchase. Again, we're trying to use stuff that's readily available, that's not, that, that's not uh, so, so, out there. So, but you are using eukaryotic and not, not are you, have you done any bacterial um, growth? Because some, some growth can be grown in bacteria, and some right. growth can be grown in yeast. Right, yeah. Uh, so one of our competing team, one of our comp competitors is MIT, and they're using a yeast-based production. Okay. They're not. I don't think they're using IVT though. I don't think they're using a cell-free system. Again, I can't comment on what MIT is doing just because I don't know. Uh, but I believe they're using a, a yeast-based system. Um, we're using the CHO-based system because it's more likely to pass through regulatory muster with the FDA. Is it possible to do bacterial in vitro photosynthesis or even traditional bacterial culture? Sure, and we use it for a lot of preliminary experiments before we move into the, the IVT system. But for, in terms of the end goal, unless we find something better, I think the, the IVT is the way to go. Okay. Um, and we're using eukaryotic simply because that makes sense from a regulatory standpoint. Also, it'll have most of the cellular machinery that you need in order to make the, the material that, uh, yeah. whatever the material my, is. My concern, though, would be, you know, um, cell lysates only last so long. True. Um, and so, shipping human, uh, you know, um, eukaryotic cell lysates mm -hmm. is a weird regulatory hurdle um, mm -hmm. because we've done it and mm -hmm. it's, it gets weird. Yep. If they ask questions, it takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, you know, that, that would be one of my concerns is, sh is shipping, you know, either these live cells or. Right cell lysates into a third world country. 
Uh, I can't I can't necessarily comment on the regulatory aspects of that just because I don't have that knowledge necessarily. I can say that we are in talks with the FDA. I can't say how far that's gone, but we are in, in talk we are talking to the FDA about it and we're doing we've got five different sub teams. You've seen expression and purification. We've got three other ones that I haven't even discussed. Uh, one of those sub teams is a regulatory affairs sub team. And the guy that's the head of the regulatory affairs sub team uh, helped was on the committee that helped to approve the first biosimilar that came through in the United States. Um, I believe it was a, a drug by Sandoz. Um, so, uh, so, so we've got a lot of expertise on the regulatory side of things, and we're we're working closely with him as well as people that we know in the FDA in order to try and make sure that this will hopefully be approved. Right. Deb, do you have a question? I do. <laughs> Did I look really anxious to ask yes. a question? I'm fired up here. So, so with these sort of point of care production systems, yeah. when you scale them, are you actually like, I mean, how do you know you're going to really produce enough for the situation and where, when you're in like some third world, you know, whatever conflict zone, yeah. You know, who's going to be the operator of this stuff? Who's, you know, is it going to be made so that, you know, somebody without a lot of technical training or somebody right. without a PhD can right. actually do this and without even the, like, kosher? Okay, so uh, the first part of the question, I, I remember the second part, I'm sorry, what was the first part again? The first part is how do you, how do you know that the scale of oh, time oh, brings right, right. down to a point of yeah, yeah. in a Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, does it even make sense to make this little drip mm -hmm, of stuff mm -hmm. when you may a whole village may need a whole bunch of this, or one person right. may need, you know, X amount every single day if mm -hmm. you're trying to crank it out of this case? Right. So does that I mean is there some maybe? I see. I see a lot in science and clinical mm -hmm. and diagnostics yeah. where they're trying to shrink things down yeah. to a point yeah. where. It doesn't match actual biology, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering about well, you know, how 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 this has been conceptualized. I'm not part of the protein expression sub team, but I do know we are getting decent expression levels, uh, in, in some of our um, in some of our model proteins. So in terms of expression level, are we are we making enough? I think we're not there yet. We're getting there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, that's why I didn't want this report. I don't want MIT knowing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, um, and for the second part of the question, um, I think I, I said before, this isn't meant to replace the pharmaceutical industry, it's meant to supplement, so it's meant for an emergency situation. Let's say your supply line gets cut off and you still have people in the village that are, or in the town that are diabetic and they need insulin. So they've got a local stockpile, but it's gonna get depleted. So if you can start making your own insulin, mm -hmm. you can start extending that. You don't have to rely on just the little so stockpile. So you can like take a drone and drop this case down in that village in the mountains. In I don't know if we would drop it, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, so parachute. Yeah. Then yeah. send a little instruction book. Yeah. You know, as, it's an emergency. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as, C, and we've got some insulin. Yeah. Part of your question also was the ease of use of this device. Yeah. That's part of the system design sub team, which again I'm not a part of. Right. Uh, my understanding, and again I, I'm speaking from a standpoint of someone that's not part of the system design sub team. My understanding is that uh, this can be used by nurses, by medical doctors, uh, and they would effectively just press a button or press a few buttons, and then it would just go automatically. It would be fully automated. Um, they just have to make sure that all the buffers are there and, and all the reagents are there and, and that type of thing. There's a third party question that I don't quite remember. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> we have a new question right here. I actually have two questions. So the first one is for Ben. Is that oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> um, so, are there any targets of your microRNA which could sort of explain that you know of, or you can discuss that would explain the phenotype that you see, or like that would explain the changes in the environment within the breast tissue? And then secondly, oh, let me, let me do okay. that one first. All right, that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So basically. What, what the project is looking at, which I couldn't really get into because of time, is there are specific targets that the marker RNA degrades and then causes the transformation to a kind of a cancer-associated uh, fibroblast. And so, um, and these are targets which are commonly down-regulated or, it's like, it's like the natural targets, but then 
the unnatural downregulation of this mRNA causes them to be overexpressed, which then causes the transformation of the cell. Okay, follow-up question. Um, does your map have mice? Do they have any like secondary phenotypes or anything? So the microRNA was originally identified in cartilage, and so and it targets and prevents the differentiation of cartilage. And so based on that, they're kind of small and they have like weird bone cartilage structure stuff. Um, but they and so they're aside from being smaller, they don't have any like obvious phenotypes. Um, but they it, there's a lot more targets of the microRNA than we're originally known. And so my lab has previously looked at this microRNA in breast cancer itself, since it targets uh, stem cell factors. So down regulation of this microRNA can increase the, uh, like the ability of the breast cancer cells to grow. Um, but now we're kind of moving to the, you know, the surrounding cells as well, and see what happens. I have a question. Now, I'm, I'm moving to a different person. So oh, was can I, yeah. yeah. I was curious. So is your the mirror 140, right? Um, it, it's in a three prime ETR or the coding region? Uh, like it's, it's a binding sequence. It's in a three prime. Three prime ETR. ETR. And do you know if any um, so any uh, proteins mm -hmm. that bind to similar sequences like uh, these RNA binding proteins that actually regulate mRNA regulation? Do you know if they uh, overlap in terms of they bind the same sequence? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't think so. But that's you right. up. Yeah, 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 I'll talk to Dr. Lewis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <He'll tell me. laughs> yeah. If you could get maybe who are, because who are is pretty anti uh, uh, cancer, depending on the cancer hit. But uh, you know, maybe if a uh, slight upper regulation might change the amount of the genes getting modulated. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, really, just quickly, Dr. Essies, are the dung beetles, are they like ubiquitously everywhere? Or are, they yeah. like, are they only in the continent? Or 9,000 species that have been described so far, they're on every continent except for Antarctica. Okay. Kind of cold there, hard for blue bugs. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. So, yeah, so <clears throat> chicken poop's a really big problem in the Chesapeake Bay. It sure is. But it's high in phosphorus. Yep. So, do dung beetles, will they. No. They no. do not like chicken litter. Okay. They will sometimes use it, but they really don't like it as much as um, as much as horse and cow and goat okay. and stuff Can like that. Can we select for those beetles that might? <laughs> 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 you know, so that's what Australia did effectively. When people yeah. brought cows um, to Australia, all the dung beetles were specialized on all these um, <coughs> vertebrates that have completely different types of dung. For example, with kangaroos, the dung beetles actually hang out on the anus waiting for the poop. Wall, wall. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> hadn't found those, hadn't collected those. But, um, <laughs> but uh, they couldn't degrade cow dung, which is why I saw that picture, you know. And so what the CSIRO did was they actually brought in, they uh, went out to places where uh, there's large ungulates, and they collected 50 different species of dung beetles and brought them into the country to see which one established best, and now they've got about 20 species well established. Mm -hmm. So what the fun part of that was they tried to sterilize the eggs ahead of time, and uh, they didn't develop. Oh. You had to get sloppy before, um, you know. Did it have any uh, other ecological effects? It's a good question. You mean like Australia's rabbit issue yeah, and yeah, everything no, else? Yeah. <laughs> no, because the thing with dung beetles, if anything, what they're going to do is they'll increase the fertility of the area because they're going to be moving more yeah. of that dung underground. But they really didn't seem to impact the area so well. They have a very defined niche. They have a very defined niche. It's just like having parasitoids. Right. Yeah. Cool. There's a question in the back back. Um, <laughs> um, so I have a question for Ken, and I apologize if I sound so really simplistic, I'm the furthest thing from the scientist in the world. Um, so from what I gathered from your presentation, it sounds like the disease you're seeking to work with only affects boys, so am I correct in assuming that? And if so, what about it? Why doesn't it affect girls as well? So the genetics are a little bit complicated. It's something that I got to brush my own back up on. The short answer is it's an X-linked mutation. So with two chromosomes, there's another there's another copy of that genetic set where you're able to make dystrophin in a compensatory fashion. Women who carry that mutation are typically carriers. So if they um, 
father, if they father, if they, <laughs> if they end up having a child with a male loose carrier, then you'll get the disease. There are other different types of muscular dystrophies. There's over a hundred something different types of muscular dystrophies uh, with different genetic mutations and different genetic causes that can affect both men and women. For example, um, FSHD, facioscapular humeral muscular dystrophy is a type that can affect both men and women. Can you speak up a little bit um, more about the uh, physical properties of the hydrogels that you're using so, with the, uh, the dystrophin inside? So I can speak very broadly. The hydrogel itself does not carry dystrophin. The stem cells that we're transplanting do. And we're looking at a number of different stem cell types from a collaborator at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm trying to keep a little bit mum on the details because even though I'm a fifth year grad student, I haven't published yet. Um, but the hydrogel itself very broadly is made up of a mixture of synthetic and natural components that have been shown to promote muscle growth and regeneration. Oh, so it's not the stem cells inside the hydrogel? It is the stem cells inside the hydrogel. The stem cells are in the hydrogel, but the hydrogel itself is made up of these artificial and natural components. And the immune system is not attacking or the, the processes around it is not the hydrogel protects the stem cells from being chewed up or degraded, is that? Effect effectively, yes. Um, <coughs> when I look at transplants in the mouse model that we're using, we use an immunodeficient mouse model. So it's a partially compromised immune system, so the cells won't be rejected. I have a question for Elizabeth. Um, is there can you explain to me the method of measuring T reg function? I guess like, I'm not really familiar. Yeah, um, so uh, there's not really a method yet. That's kind of what I'm trying to establish. Um, so I think that, or our hypothesis is that they're not going to be able to suppress the production of antibodies. But another grad student in my lab thinks that maybe the metabolic, metabolic, metabolism in the T regs might be messed up. Um, so. Yeah, I guess the short answer is we don't know yet, and there's not really a method to do that. That's kind of what I'm trying to establish. Um, the only method that's out there is looking at how they suppress T conventional cells. So um, these cells don't make antibody, but they can attack parts of your body, or they can, they're often thought of as like the orchestrators of the immune system. And there's an assay where you show that the healthy T regs suppress the proliferation of these T orchestrator cells. Um, so that would be in a healthy person. And the evidence as to whether or not that's happening in autoimmunity is kind of complicated because there's another theory that it's not the Tregs that are dysfunctional, but the cells that they're suppressing are less able to be suppressed. So just because you're not seeing suppression from when you get the cells from an autoimmune patient doesn't mean that the Tregs aren't doing their job. It could just mean that those orchestrator cells are better at not being suppressed. <coughs> Hey, I have a question for Richard. <laughs> this is Moody cerebellum. <laughs> so the cerebellum's not only the little brain, it's also sort of the old brain. Yes. So I was curious about uh, what models, I assume you're not following fluorescent axon. The, no, the these are mice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. they're a model organism. So, so I wonder what your thoughts are on the implications of um, uh, a role for the cerebellum in, um, in mood and emotion. Uh, with respect to all the other organisms on Earth besides humans? Um, mm. so, so we have some, um, there, there, there are animal models actually for autism that involve like selectively degenerating Purkinje cells which are found in the cerebellum. And like this is only targeting Purkinje cells so that they slowly degrade over time. Um, but they find that there's these social defects in the mice. Mice normally um, approach novel mice over those that they're familiar with, um, which these models do not. They are like ambivalent to that. But um, the mice can usually also approach novel animals versus a random object, and these mice that have degeneration in cerebellum do not. Um, so, so there's that, which is very interesting. And the second is that we've, um, in my lab, like had some preliminary. Um, behavioral experiments, like stimulating a specific part of the cerebellum. 
um, because we're looking at, oh yeah, you know, there's motor stuff, but what about like, um, uh, like sort of emotive sort of thing? Like um, we're, we're hypothesizing that the cerebellum <coughs> actually activates a lot of this autonom um, autonomic system, like sort of flight and flight, uh, fight and flight um, defensive response. Um, so we activate a, a selective part of cerebellum, and we see that like there's a lot of movement, but they also seize up. They sort of freeze as if in, they're like threatened. Um, and this sort of um, this correlates with what we find in our anatomical studies. Uh, um, specific parts of cerebellum project to parts of the brain that are involved with pain, that are involved with like um, aggression behavior, as well as serotonin, which might also be involved with um, long-term mood as well as pain. Um, so what we're thinking is like when we activate, you know, this still pretty general area, like we're activating these downstream circuits that are involved with pain or um, aggression. Um, so it's it's still there's still a lot to be worked out, but um, there's a lot of really old literature actually, like back in the 1960s or 70s, where they just stick it an electrode into this part of the cerebellum and they just stimulate it, and they did this with cats, I think, and like the the paper was just like there's the first figure is like. Here's what happens when you stimulate this cat in this part of the brain. It attacks something. Here's the rat. <laughs> just eating the rat when you stimulate this thing. It's just, and it's like, you know, no one really followed up on this. And um, our thought is like, um, if you stimulate part of the hypothalamus, the same thing happens. And we find these connections from the cerebellum to the hypothalamus. So maybe um, that's one possible explanation for what these guys like decades ago saw. So it's like there there are many different ways I think that you um, you could see different like mood behaviors, but we currently have to like parse out the different um, intricacies, or else we're just going to activate a lot of different things. Um, one. So if you just think about the connections that you see, yeah, right. How how far away are they conserved? Can you go to like lizards and fish and see the same hmm. similar things, or is it pretty limited to now? This I don't know. Um, yeah, I haven't, I, I haven't looked in the literature but in, into this um, contribution. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are, though. Like, there's like the zebrafish, there's like escape behavior and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I might look into that. That's a really good idea. Um, I have another question for you. Um, so the cell types in the cerebellum that you're trying to characterize and categorize, are they found in the rest of the brain also, or are they specific to the cerebellum? So, so we, we did a, like a gene expression um, profiling, um, and if, um, these genes are found elsewhere in the brain. Like one is uh, like Kelbindin or Kelretinin, and like a lot of cells express that, or a lot of cells express particular potassium channels, for example. But we found that like at least in this, um, you know, small part of the cerebellum, we could like <coughs> of the 100 or so genes that we characterize, we could split off um, seven different types um, based on like, oh, there's a subset that's located in this part of the brain that does not have this potassium channel, whereas the one in the back does. Um, but these genes are found elsewhere as well, so it's not exclusive to the cerebellum. One, one or two more questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for Anne. So you have a really interesting system going, and I noticed in your experiment, what you did is um, you sterilized the dung mm -hmm. so that you could just look what the beetles had, right, mm -hmm. as going through the system from, from the way But in the, in the natural world, of course, the dung is not right. sterile. No. So what I'm curious about is um, <clears throat> what your thoughts would be. I'm, I'm, just, yeah. I'm wondering about this as a system for looking at the interaction between environment and the individual beetles in their life cycle as well. If you made it under control, the experiment where you could ask what happens to the, the beetle microbiome when the other when it's interacting with the dung microbiome, um, right during the during its life cycle, and does it right. affect the um, uh, productivity of the of the animal, right? Um, that you're looking at. Right? Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, one of the slides that I didn't go over as well as I could since I was making too many dumb jokes. Um, it's so tempting. <laughs> but uh, so, so when you, we actually went out and we grabbed adults straight from um, a dung from a pat, yeah. and we grabbed the dung right next to where they were. Yeah. So when we sequence those, we see completely different bacterial profiles. Mm -hmm. So all the animal dung groups together, no matter if it's from horse or cow, or dairy or beef cow, which actually is really different, or a goat. 
And then that's really different from all the beetles. It's the same species of beetles, but collected on all those different kinds of poop. So it seems like the beetle really has a very separate microbiome from what it's found in the, um, in the cat. Even better than that, or even more surprising than that, I thought that they would probably, because the literature is full of all these dung beetle biologists saying, oh, the adults are just sieving through and eating the microbes. Well, when we actually take the animals and we hold them, so we take some fresh from the dung and we kill them, and then we take another set and we hold them for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, thinking they'll purge their gut, and if they're bringing in something, they'll have a different profile, bacterial profile, than those that are freshly killed. So the freshly killed should be kind of similar to the, um, to the pet, but um, would be really different from, they're all the same. So the beetles are always the same. It doesn't seem like they're really getting much overlap from the dung at all. So in your, in your experiment where there's, the dung has been sterilized, <coughs> what are they eating? So it can't be those microorganisms anymore, right? Or they are, but they're Right. Bad. Well, so, but <laughs> with that, the, the adults aren't feeding. The, the only thing that's provisioned is to the larva, and the larva are eating the cellulosic part. <coughs> I see. So. It's like a high fiber diet. It's like a high fiber <laughs> diet, <laughs> exactly. But the other aspect of that too is um, when we treat these animals with, when we feed them antibiotic treated dung, mm -hmm. they actually eat twice as much dung as those that aren't fed mm -hmm. the antibiotics, which makes me think that um, you know they really the bacteria are being killed off and they need to um, do more processing. But at the same time, we also have found cultured isolates that. Um, are resistant to antibiotics. So, um, That's fascinating. it's at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question for Anne. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried to isolate the, um, the mother's dung that they leave in the, the pod and, and test out of those, take it out and see how the young uh, grow without it? Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, <laughs> to actually get the sequencing from just the mother's fecal pellet, it's so tiny, you really can't get that. Um, we have collaborators who have gone through and they've sterilized, they've removed the pedestal and uh, just put the egg in there, so where there's no mom fecal mass, but there is the blue ball wall, and then they've gone in and they've, yeah, so that's, yeah. And when they do that, when they remove the pedestal, it takes the larva longer to develop. It generally doesn't, and it, but that's if it still has the brood ball wall. If you sterilize the brood ball wall as well, then they don't, they die after the second or third larval end star. So it really seems like it's a pretty tight. Yeah, the, the interesting biome from the mother is, is incredibly important. Yeah, it seems like. That's the last question. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a scientist at all, but I, um, well, I can't answer my family So I was the Ben. Yeah. Do you, as part of your research about the higher levels of estrogen in the obese mice, how that affects? So that's, yeah, that's not something that we are researching, but it is definitely a reason for the increased levels of breast cancer in obese postmenopausal women. Because, you know, postmenopause, uh, your estrogen levels are decreasing significantly, but the fat cells still produce estrogen. And so when you have increased fat cells and fat cells that are producing more hormones, uh, that's one of the thoughts is that that increased level of estrogen postmenopause is, uh, Leading to the increase in breast cancer, but it's not—it's not the direction we're going in. And also, the, the idea that maybe a lot of women maybe they had no children, only one child, like that would be a separate thing too. Like, yeah. More, um, yeah. Once once we get into hormonal things, it's you know definitely incredibly important for breast cancer, and uh, but it's not the direction that we're going in. We're looking more at how the obesity changes the microenvironment itself, <coughs> and then. Um, so outside of the hormonal production by the fat cells, how the fat cells are secreting factors which are then changing the other cells in the microenvironment and producing a different kind of microenvironment which is pro-tumorigenic and causing cancer or increases cancer. Um, another question for Ben. Um, I was actually saw a. Um, I, I was like, last question. Yeah. I, okay. Um, I have actually seen a presentation from someone doing very similar research, um, but they're focusing on the effects of inflammation on cancer. Yeah. Um, uh, are you guys taking into consideration, um, uh, you know, that kind of that kind of information because um, those could really affect 
the um, the um, the phenotype of certain cells, especially. Right. Um, so this is basically an effect of inflammation. Um, inflammation and the the molecules being that are higher at higher levels in inflammation, like TGF beta, have been uh, shown to decrease the levels of MIR140. So one of our hypotheses is that's how MIR140 is being downregulated. MIR140 also then uh, targets those pathways and increases the levels of inflammation <coughs> in obesity. So this might all be because of the increased levels of inflammation in obesity, and it could be a mechanism for how, because increased inflammation causes you know increased cancer. So this could be a mechanism for that. Mm, I haven't talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the, all these great questions, and again. Uh, so before we get into uh, who won what, um, we're going to talk a little bit about upcoming events between both Bob's and Project Bridge. So do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Um, sure, I will go first. Uh, I guess I looked before that. Um, if you have any extra um, post-its, just throw them on one of these piles. You can save them for later. And if you also have any recommendations or suggestions about how this event is going, please let us know. Um, this is we, the first time we did it. So. Yeah. <laughs> We really want to keep this going. I think this is really fun, and I think everybody's really uh, being really engaging, and I think uh, this is great. Um, so Project Bridge, we have two pretty much like our bread and butter events. Is One is a science cafe. So it's essentially one person uh, speaking at a restaurant or a bar in the city um, about a singular topic for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then the rest of the time is Q&A. So it's like this, but just one person. So <laughs> like more focus. and. Um, uh, it gets really cool, it's really exciting, we have really fun topics. Our next one is actually in slight collaboration with um, BUDS, with the whole microbiome project. Um, I was right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll... Uh-oh. Uh, I have the information. But um, our next Science Cafe is on April 11th, I think, at the Motor House, um, which is in Station North, um, in collaboration with Margaret from um, MICA. Um, so let me pull up. What the heck? I don't want to. I wish I don't mess up. Um, okay. So it's a curated project uh, called Culture as Medium. Um, our our science speaker. Our speaker is um, Dr. Claire Fraser at the University of Maryland, and she's going to be talking about the microbiome. Um, she actually had this really cool project from a few years ago, I think, about looking at the microbiome in the Amish. Um, I don't know what she's going to talk about, but I think that's really fascinating. Um, so this is. Uh, a, also, Bugs is also having an event here to kind of do like an art and microbiome um, kind of um, exhibit. So check that out too. And um, we also have our science at the farmers markets coming up again, um, starting at the Waverly Farmers Market. We do really fun, engaging demos um, for kids of all ages. Um, that's once a month on Saturdays. Um, check us out online. Um, and then our really cool, ambitious future event is going to be the Baltimore Brain Festival. Um, it's still in the works. It, this is literally the first time I think I've ever talked about it in public. Um, it's happening in uh, September 17th, and it sounds exactly like what you think it is. It's a day-long um, event full of hands-on demos, talks, um, engaging activities at Northwest Baltimore. Um, so to engage a community that doesn't really get access to um, science. Um, it's a fun way, grassroots way to um, approach science, and we're using brain science, neuroscience, as, as a gateway to get kids and families um, to be interested. So hit me up, let me know, talk to me afterwards if you want more information. Look at us online at Project Bridge. Okay. And so yeah, so we um, unfortunately can't say, definitely we have a prospective meeting um, next week. So we have lab meetings, and I want to let everybody know that anybody's invited to our lab meetings. Um, so come and listen to what the members are talking about next year. Next one, which is either next Thursday or the first Thursday of April, sorry about the mix up, but we haven't worked it out uh, quite yet. Uh, we're meeting with the uh, Baltimore Fab Lab uh, people that are gonna start talking uh, about how we can do some hardware work, um, so it should be cool. And then hopefully we'll have some uh, industrial commons, which is a kind of a makerspace um, that Adol uh, is a part of.
They're out of Hagerstown, yeah. 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 Um, so other things, we have seminars as well uh, here at Bugs. So coming up on the 23rd, we have the Science of Coffee, coffee, and there will be a tasting. Um, and we all know the number one uh, uh, consumer of coffee is scientists. Um, so there will be tasting there. At 7 and p.m.? It's 7 p.m. But you've never been to the and it's Zeke's coffee, and they actually do a lot of uh, really neat little sciencey seminars themselves. So they're pretty. They're going to give us a sampling of what, not their coffee, but also what, how they teach the public about the science of coffee. Um, and then, of course, as Daniel was just talking about, we're going to have Margaret McDonald's uh, wonderful exhibit coming up. So that's, yeah, it's uh, going to start April 8th, and then we're going to go all the way to May 20th. And, and yeah, please give us an overview of this awesome. Sure, this is good. I didn't know I'd get a chance to highlight it. Um, so I, I am at MICA, uh, the art, art institution, that is, I, I, but I come from a uh, background in science, so I'm kind of subverting some things in there. Um, the exhibition will be all uh, back art that's created or research, researching bacteria for the art. Um, some fantastic people. We have Anna Dimitrio, which is, she's a really big get, honestly. She, there's going to be a couple of pieces in this space of hers. Um, and Francois Joseph Lacroix, who's a, he's both a microbiologist, um, who I think I connected with you. Yes, just, just yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so excited. He's, he's so fantastic. He's, a, he's now doing uh, he does performance art to collect data about the microbiome and great stuff. He's going to do um, a, a couple of performances, um, so we can we can talk more about that. And uh, and Tal Danino, who's a synthetic biologist up at uh, Columbia, who's also dipping into the art world too. So so it's a really interesting group of people who fall in the boundary of art and science, um, and it's happening here at Buzz, it's also happening at Motor House. So it's kind of a, we're, I'm framing it in both the art community in Baltimore and the science community in Baltimore. So I'm pushing that boundary of what we can think of as art and science. So I hope you come. I think we're, we're going to have event April 1st is the official opening at Motor House. There'll be a tasting by um, Hex Ferments of their products. And Francois Joseph may be doing a performance, so it's really worth checking out. I think he's Proposing something about eating a lot of kimchi and measuring his microbiome. <laughs> 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 and there, and Hex Ferment is all about it, so I'm really excited. And uh, and then there's going to be a whole ton of other things that are happening. That um, so as as they, as I have all the dates confirmed, you can check out the website cultureasmedium.com. Um, but we'll we're working on trying to come up with a reception time for here. There'll definitely be a closing on May 20th. There's going to be a lot of things happening around this exhibition. So, so hopefully it'll be a lot of fun for everybody in the city. So, anyway, good. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I'm also a science blogger. I blog about the human microbiome, and I'll put some cards and actually a little infl infl inflammation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Information packets that were from uh, American Society for Microbiology about the human microbiome. I actually talked to two second grade classes this morning about the human microbiome, so that's why I've got it for those. So hopefully, uh, well, I made some extra for y'all too. But anyway, I'm going to put those on the table if you'd like those, and I'm going to go to bed soon. <laughs> Send me questions. I'd really love it. It'd be awesome. All right. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, yeah. So again, please stay around and please interact more, and hopefully you all can stay around for a little bit. Okay, so this is this is what we've been waiting for. Um, super exciting. Okay, so we have third place, second place, and first place for both um, categories. Um, everybody good? Um, okay, so for so we're gonna start. I'm gonna do the like most creative category. All right, so for the third place winner, a $15 gift certificate to Target um, is Anne. <laughs> uh, uh, second place for most creative is Ailo. Oh, 
That's fine. Thank you. Um, and grand prize um, for our creative is Richard. <laughs> okay, so the most effectively communicated. <clears throat> Third prize is Elizabeth. The second prize is Anne. Oh. <laughs> Giving everybody a bug. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Thank you for participating. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Tell, yeah. tell everybody about bugs and Project Bridge. Yeah, we're Thank you. Wow. Oh yeah, and if yeah, anybody wants to also get involved in um, the Baltimore Brain Festival, we're looking for partners to kind of help build this event too. So. <laughs> that reminds me also, uh, anybody is interested in volunteering or coming to Bugs for any reason at all, you have a quirky idea, we love to hear quirky ideas, so please bring them to us. Um, contact um, us through any of the social medias that you see. Um, we have a meetup group, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, Facebook. That reminds me, thank you for the live tweeters. That was awesome. I liked every single one of them. <laughs> Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, also, uh, you can take my card and just email me if you wanted to. So, now let's the party begin. <laughs>